Well, to give us uh, an update and a bit of sense of what these COVID-19 numbers, uh, uh, trends in the country uh, mean, is Acting Executive Director at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, Adrian Perrin. Uh, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, always good to talk to you. Thanks for your time. Indeed, Peter. Thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity and the evening to your viewers. All right. So make sense of these numbers and these trends because they were up and then it looked like they were going down and there were days I was in here and I'd say that, you know, there's just been 2,000 new cases uh, reported. And then now they're up again. How do we make sense of this? I thought that the waves work by going to a peak and then tapering off. Yeah, so, uh, as well as not always being uniform, I yeah. sense, you know, there's mm. been a different geographical spread, if you like, um, starting off with Gauteng, and that had the, the most massive um, wave, if you like. And in fact, Gauteng continues its downward um, trajectory, and, and I think, as far as I know, should be out of its third wave. But the rest of the country, I think it's a different picture. And you're quite right. Initially, I think there was a slow traje trajectory in the Western Cape, but this continues to, um, to increase. I think there was obviously, in the case of KwaZulu Natal, um, certainly an upward trajectory, and then obviously the um, civil unrest events certainly um, led to a so called decline, but we thought that that was unlikely to be the case. In fact, that, that <laughs> has proven to be the fact that there. Onward trajectory certainly continues in the Eastern Cape, uh, in the in, in KwaZulu Natal, and certainly we are certainly seeing a similar trajectory in the case of um, the Eastern Cape, Northern Cape as well. A, a picture there too, an ongoing transmissions. I think we initially thought there was going to be declines, but it certainly is ongoing as well as in the Free State as well. So it's only really the Gauteng, Limpopo, and I. And seen in Bumalanga, though it had a similar trajectory, a downward trajectory, in fact, there may be changes across there. So I think it's multitudes, a multitude possible explanations around mm -hmm. this. Um, and in fact, you know, as we know, the Delta uh, variant is in circulation. So there's, that certainly is a, a likely contributor to the types of pictures that we're currently seeing. And obviously the events that contribute to um, onward um, transmission may well continue, whether that be um, events where there are large gatherings, for example, clusters of cases, maybe even at schools, I think that has been reported, where um, onward transmission um, is certainly uh, occurring. So when you look at it over a period of time and on an aggregate basis because of these variations in, in, in provinces, where are we uh, in this third wave? Yeah, so I think we, it's a mixed bag, as you yeah. quite rightly say. I think it's, you know, compared to the first and second wave where I think it was fairly obvious what was happening yeah. overall, I think now we have to look at the provinces by province and see what's happening in each particular province to really understand or get a better picture. Um, my sense is that um, although Gauteng certainly is coming out of its um, third wave, if you like, or resurgence, and um, the other provinces are still, I think, a way mm. to go. Um, especially provinces like the Western Cape, Kosovo Natal, and, and the Eastern Cape. Again, it's difficult to understand yeah. and, and know what's actually happening in the other provinces, such as the Northern Cape, as well as, as Free State, where there are still high instances and ongoing um, transmission. So I think, although the hospitalizations have certainly declined again overall, um, I think there are still considerations when you look at, say, the Western Cape, um, KwaZulu Natal and Eastern Cape with regard to what stressors there may well be on those particular systems um, in the next few weeks as well. So we know that this thing travels through people and I wonder then does that mean if we uh, allow people to carry on moving around it may be that Gauteng people moved it to the provinces or might we see a spike in Gauteng again as people from the provinces uh, other provinces come to Gauteng, for example? Yes, yeah, so movement is, is an important consideration. Um, so that may well contribute, but I'm hoping that um, if people are, if there is, if there is movement um, into provinces or cross provinces, um, that in, in effect that we still need to continue and emphasize how do we manage and control um, those events in terms of close contact again. So it comes back to the fact that we have at least um, some evidence of a decrease in mobility during curfews, for example. So maybe that may well be a, an important contributor. But I think that, in fact, the emphasis still means that the, the so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions are still critical. And in fact, we still need to get 
those messages across to communities, to individuals that having a mask, wearing it properly, correctly, physical distancing, you know, all those particular messages that we've been saying over the last 18 months or more still need to be in place, even though people are moving to probably a greater extent than I think over the last uh, few months or, or, or weeks at least. So I think that emphasis still needs to remain. I think. I know that we have a vaccine campaign. Um, it's an early stage. It's, there's only 4 million fully uh, vaccinated. So it still comes back to the fact that um, those non-pharmaceutical interventions need to remain um, in, in place. Bottom line, the, the issue really, I guess, is that the protocols are what's going to stop and slow down the pandemic and that the vaccine's really about stopping and slowing down hospitalizations and deaths, but the infections can only really be controlled by us doing the protocols. Absolutely, you're quite right. Um, so in fact, I think one of the bright spots, if you like, um, during this third resurgence is, is the fact that I think there's good evidence to emphasize your particular point that we will vaccinate, but people will still um, become infected. But the consequences of those vaccinations is the fact that there'll be there will certainly be infections, but the, the infections will be milder. Mm -hmm. Hospitalizations will certainly decrease, as well as deaths. So I think there's good evidence to show that those are going to be the protocols. So in other words, we need to vaccinate, and we need to vaccinate at, at far greater rates than we are currently doing in order to have that type of scenario that we've certainly seen with the, the Sazonki uh, trial results. I guess this hesitancy story, it's a, it's a worldwide phenomena, and um, I'm wondering where we are in com comparison to other countries in the world in terms of our hesitancy issue and what we can do uh, to shift that, because it's, I'm still finding it odd that someone could tell you that everybody that's now in the hospital is because they weren't vaccinated, and yet they still will doubt whether they should get vaccinated or not. Yes, I, I think it's important to come. Your, I think your point is really a critical point. I think it's, it's, it's how do we manage our risk? And you raise that very important point that people who are now in hospital who have not been vaccinated, that particular proportion will, is far likely to be higher than those individuals that have been vaccinated. And I think there's good evidence from the Sasaki um, results. There's good evidence from various other countries. But it's really hard to convince mm. individuals to see and get into perspective their risk. What, is, what would we rather prefer, that I be unvaccinated and end up in hospital, where I have, which is the risk is greater, compared to whether I'm being vaccinated? And I think mm. it's really trying to get those key messages across yeah. and uh, and i noticed in your clip it's really when you look at the ratio of females to to males again males are problematic in that particular sense so how do we appeal to those males is it really about hesitancy or is it combinations of hesitancy and and access um, okay. you know are we uh, for example I, i'm hoping that for example we should see vaccinations over weekends, for example, um, or particular sites or areas yeah. where I think men uh, are, feel more comfortable um, in terms of being vaccinated. I think similar problems have actually occurred with, for example, male circumcision. You know, what are the different strategies yeah. um, that have to be thought through in order to attract males to be, for example, circumcised? And I think similar principles will apply. Is what is it about that particular male? Or are there different categories of males that we need to try and, and uh, appeal to? Um, so it's about a hesitancy. I don't think it's initially anti-vaccination. I think it's making it um, such that they yeah. feel comfortable to, to be vaccinated. And perhaps the final question on an epidemiological uh, uh, level. Um, I, I'm just wondering, uh, this, this whole thing about herd immunity... What does it actually now mean for us um, if we know that vaccines aren't preventing infection, it's really just about s staying minimally ill and uh, not dying? So what does herd immunity mean in that kind of environment? Yeah, so I, I think it comes back to the fact that we need to, and in fact the the presence of the variants has certainly also contributed to our understanding of all. Oh, can we really be using the term herd immunity? I, I noticed that there's, there's a fair amount of discussion around that. But I think it's really um, saying, well, 
to what extent can we um, vaccinate? What what are the numbers that we need to reach to vaccinate um, in order to, for for example, to really ensure that we have, there may well be infections, we need to acknowledge that, but that in fact we will decrease hospitalizations mm -hmm. and deaths. So I think the thinking has to change and I think we need to start adapting um, to that. I don't think it will, it should not contribute to, to, to hesitancy and, 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 and anti-vaxxer, because I think that there are, there's good evidence to show from these different countries that in fact uh, vaccination, even though it may not be optimal, and we've seen the results recently from um, the UK. But I think the evidence is certainly good that it will be milder disease. And in fact, there may be some evidence that it may prevent onward transmission. But the key point is that it's about hospitalizations and death. And that, that, that will be one of the key focuses for um, being vaccinated. Adrian Perrin, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so, so much indeed for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you very much for the time.